normal, and then now they are viewed in all its real and raw violence. Um, the complexity of these problems requires an interdisciplinary approach uh, that takes into account the interplay of multiple causes, both at individual and social levels, ethical, uh, economic, uh, legal factors should also be included. As psychoanalysts, it's part of our social commitment to help uh, combat this problem with our specific tools in the detection, treatment and prevention of these situations. Psychoanalytical theories uh, on trauma, on intergenerational transmission are key concepts of recognized value in the understanding and approaching to this problem. Well, today we'll have the opportunity to hear and to discuss with three psychoanalysts from different countries. Uh, they are members of the Child Abuse Community and part of the IPA in the Community Project. Uh, they'll share with us all, your, all the knowledge and experience uh, to better understand the root causes of child abuse on its different forms. So we are ready to begin. But uh, before handing over to the panelists, I explain very briefly how we are going to function. The webinar has two sections. In the first, we'll hear the introductory text. Then the second part is a question and answer slot in which all of you, the attendees, might have the opportunity to discuss with us. Uh, you might send your questions uh, and post them. Look at the right side, please, of, the, of your screen and in the control panel. You'll find a, a little box entitled question. You have to write and post your questions there. Uh, you might send them along the whole course of the webinar, but uh, Remember, please, that they are going to be answered only after the presentations. You also can download the presentations uh, clicking on the another tab, also in the control panel called handouts. Simply, you have to click on the hand on the name of the handout you want to download, and it will appear on your screen. Um, well, uh, a last comment. Remember also that this is an open uh, discussion and all the opinions, all the ideas shared by panelists and attendees are our own responsibility. Well, now we are ready and I introduce the panelists. Firstly, we'll hear Dr. Madi Mann. Before we hand over to her, I'd like to read a very brief resume of her professional activities. Mali is an adult, adolescent and child psychiatrist and psychoanalyst in the San Francisco Bay Area. She's a training and supervising psychoanalyst and child analytic supervisor at the San Francisco Center for Psychoanalysis. She's currently the chair of the Child Abuse Project of the International Psychoanalytic Association. She served as chair of the North American Committee on Child and Adolescent Psychoanalysis um, and was uh, chair of the Committee of Women's Psychoanalysis. She's a clinical professor adjunct at the Stanford University School of Medicine, the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science. She, was, she has special interest in psychoanalytical aspect of assisted reproductive technology, twins, adoption, and global heat. 
she is involved in the flying doctor missions. Well, Mali, it's your turn now. Uh, are you ready? Thank you, Ines. Yes, I am. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I thought I would at least go over um, briefly about the, the definitions of the child abuse because uh, different disciplines define it differently. And then I'll um, go on with my paper. Um, as uh, Ines mentioned, this is a very broad topic and so uh, we are only able to uh, cover aspects of the child abuse and neglect and maltreatment. So the definition um, of what constitutes child abuse varies among professionals, as we know, between social cultural groups and across time. The term abuse and maltreatment are often used interchangeably in the literature. Child maltreatment can also be an umbrella term covering all forms of child abuse and child neglect. Defining child maltreatment depends on prevailing cultural values as they relate to children, child developments, and parenting. Definitions of child maltreatment can vary across the sector of society which deal with the issue, such as child protection, child advocates, since members of the, these various fields tend to use their own definitions. Communications across disciplines can be limited and sometimes it hampers efforts to identify, uh, assess and track it down uh, or treatment, um, preventing the child maltreatment. I'll just uh, give you one uh, defi definition because WHO and CDC also, they are very similar definitions about the child abuse. So in general, it, uh, child abuse refers to the acts of commission, which neglect refers to acts of omission. Child maltreatment includes both acts of commission and acts of omission on the part of parents or caregivers that cause actual or threatened harm to a child. And some health professionals and authors consider neglect as part of the definitions of abuse while other people do not. And this is because the harm may have been unintentional or because the caregiver did not understand the severity of the problem, which may have been the result of cultural beliefs about how to raise a child. Delayed effects of child abuse and neglect, especially emotional neglect, and the diversity of acts that qualify as child abuse are also important factors. So I won't go into WHO definition, which is similar to what I have mentioned. And then Center for Disease Control and Prevention also uses a child maltreatment referred to both acts of commission abuse, which includes words or overt actions that cause harm and potential harm or threat of harm to a child. And acts of omission, which is neglect, meaning the failure to provide for a child the basic physical, emotional, and educational needs, or to protect a child from harm or potential harm. And then there is a third definition also, which is similar. The United States Federal Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act defines, defines child abuse and neglect as, at minimum, any recent act or failure to act on the part of a parent or caregiver, which results in death, serious physical or emotional harm, sexual abuse and exploitation, or act or failure to act, which presents an imminent risk of serious harm. So, as we all know, it, there are different types of it, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and now 
later on, one of our panelists, Jennifer, is going to cover um, a new addition, which we call it, you know, digital abuse. And so right now I'm going to mention that how our committee, the intercommittee, which is an interdisciplinary committee that um, includes uh, six of us involved in the IPA. And so the, the effort has to do with the recognition of child abuse and the transmission of intergenerational trauma, which is a vital effort for us psychoanalysts to recognize and keep that in forefront of our mind. And so we need to, uh, which requires the active therapeutic involvement of child and adolescent psychoanalysts. So the psychoanalytic approach to child abuse also springs from our in-depth knowledge of and experience with trauma, which is, we emphasize on that, which is, it, you know, requires the trauma work, which is a special uh, interest of some of us who work with kids. And uh, given the statistic, it's uh, uh, quite common. And um, I won't get into detail of this statistic, but a quarter of all adults, they report having been physically abused as children. That's pretty high. And one in five women and one in 13 men report having been sexually abused as child. And there are the consequences of that which uh, creates the impaired lifelong physical and mental health issues and societal and occupational outcomes and ultimately a slow um, country's economic and social developments. One could look at it in that broader sense. It does affect um, all community. And so I'm going to move on with my <clears throat> topic today, which has to do with abused children and their abusing family. Uh, as I said, it's a very broad topic. As you know, child abuse is defined, um, which I already defined it, but it's this described as reaching an epidemic kind of proportion. And it's a serious problem, not only in North America, but in Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia. A mobilization of national concern and resources had begun in the United States in 1975 to alleviate child abuse, which reached to a turning point. The problem of child abuse had its roots in ancient history, but it did not receive widespread public recognition until 1962, when a description of battered child syndrome entered in the media. Violence in inflicted on children was viewed as a public health problem which affected family members, parents, and children. The Child Abuse Prevention Act has been signed into law. The National Center on Child Abuse and Neglect was in operation, and the National Committee for Prevention of Child Abuse had been established. Um, so for the first time, the federal government made long-term grants of millions of dollars available to programs designed to prevent child abuse identify cases and alleviate the consequences to the family of abused children by effective intervention. And many states launched public education campaigns to encourage the reporting of suspected cases of abuse and detections of early signs of child abuse. I want to give a very brief vignette about one of my cases that was abused as a child, as a child who was 10 years old in uh, my practice in analysis. And um, I had him, he's a 10 year old, in analysis for approximately nine months. And one day he came in and very angry and showed me all the black and blue mark on his neck and shoulder. And he lifted his shirt and showed it stretched all the way to close to his abdomen. I said, see, this is what my mother did. 
today and see Dr. Mann. I could have called police on her, but I didn't because I didn't want to get her into trouble. So just keeping in mind, it's a very complex issue when we as child analysts, child mental, mental health people uh, encounter cases like that. So I was um, wondering to myself, what do I need to do? Because we were trained to make a call for the Child Protective Service. But he, the patient, 10 year old, very uh, precocious and um, articulate, told me that, you know, I know how to call 911 and get the police to come, but I decided not to. And I know you will see your, my, my mom. And he, yeah, I was seeing the mother in parent work and I was seeing him uh, regularly uh, three to four times a week. So I said, you know, I'm going to take this up with the mother. So these are the dilemma that we will face in, in the work that we do, you know, to report or not to report. And, and because it does really impact the kind of work that we do. Um, then if you report, it would be sort of end of our work with the, um, so I will tell you later uh, how I handled it, but just for you to, to introduce the subject and one of the issues that we deal with. Okay. Um, so uh, th this is what uh, our a task is as a, a mental health people and uh, child analysts, child psychiatrists, that we ought to be able to help parents and how to prevent and how to stop that. And then treatment is very important for us. And the focus on the treatment of abusing parents and preventing them from repeating the abuse and neglect are not um, completely researched and evaluated in most part of the world. We cannot just punish the parents and place the children in foster homes. Legal, medical, mental health professionals are generally holding a pessimistic view about abusing parents. So they see them as beyond help. Since they are seen as repeating the abuse as they were subjected to the abuse themselves, what was done to them, they do to their children turning passive into active or identifying with the legacy of their past abuse. There has not been an effective way to prevent and treat such cases. And there has been limited success in doing individual dynamic psychotherapy or rehabilitating parents who abuse their children. What can be a child psychoanalyst accomplished by treating abused children and their parents are most crucial. And what can be accomplished through our analytic work, group and individual psychotherapy for abusing um, abusive parents. <clears throat> through our innovative interventions stemming from our own psychoanalytic models concerning the causes of abuse and with our psychoanalytic techniques, we potentially will be able to provide a conceptual framework with abusive parents and abused children. I want to emphasize the system nature of child abuse so that the root cause and the applied therapeutic intervention could be properly understood and appropriately designed. Before I discuss the system approach, I want to go over the impact of the child abuse on child's attachment system. Abuse by an attachment figure undermines the very existence of the child's psyche. Bromberg says, for every human being, the preservations of self-continuity has the highest evolutionary priority. The two highest priorities for all living organisms are to preserve the coherence of the psyche and to preserve the capacity for agency. Abuse is an assault that fragments the psyche in terms of their function. Parent is not supposed to harm their children. 
intentionally. The child is unable to cannot um, reconcile psychologically the image of the loving parent with their experience of abusive parents. It's not only because the child cannot mentalize, but he does so. He cannot comprehend how it could be that his parent wanted to hurt. Therefore, the need to split off the terrifying experiences is devastating, as Otto Kernberg and his colleagues had referred to. Abuse makes the child helpless and unable to defend himself or to make any kind of appeal to the abusing parent. Therefore, there is an intense sense of terror which spikes high and makes the child physically paralyzed. The combinations of inability to comprehend and inability to act often leads to a sense of helplessness and failure. The abusive parents gather the child's belief in a safe family environment and his external world. The child clings to the belief that the parent must be right in their perception, that he is bad. It's not uncommon that the abusive parents blame the child for being bad. And abuse evokes anger in the child, which has to be kept hidden. The experience of the anger confirms the child's badness. And the strong attachment bond leads to idealization of parents. The child tries to please the parent in active way and split off the unintegrated rage, terror, and helplessness. When the bond is weak, the child may act out his rage as a defense against the split of helplessness that experience at the hands of the abuser and against oneself. Here I would stop because there are more things we can cover during our question and answer at this point. I think Ines wants to introduce the second. Um, yes. Thank you, Mahdi. Thank you for you have highlighted some key concepts on the complex nature of this problem, which uh, requires, as you mentioned, a system approach which involves all the multiple interacting causes. Well, now I'd like to say a few words about Dr. Vera Regina Fonseca, who is our next panelist. She's a training and supervising analyst of the Brazilian Psychoanalytic Society of Sao Paulo. She's currently the di director of training of Sao Paulo and was its scientific chair. Her doctoral thesis focuses on interdisciplinary studies in autistic disorders. She has been a postdoctoral researcher in postpartum depression and child development. She works in private practice as a child psychiatrist and as a psychoanalyst with children and adults. Her interests are developmental psychopathology, research and politics. Well, Vera, we wait for you. Thank you. Uh, Psychoanalysis emphasize the capital role helplessness in infancy and childhood has in human development. Taking into account such vulnerability and acting according to it is one of the cornerstones of civilization. The protection provided for a parental environment creates the conditions for child's maturation, for acquiring the capacity of symbolizing, for using imagination and transforming emotions, being able to give up and acting, for being the agent of one's own life and coping with the demands of external reality. I'm also considering the transit between schizoparanoid position 
in the mode fight or flight to the passive position in which empathy, uh, interjective identification and collaboration are possible. Thus, the existence of unconscious fantasies could be respected as such as fantasies. Uh, and its enactment would be constrained by parental protective care. But clinical and statistical facts reveal that such protection often fails, going the opposite way. Those responsible for caring become the very perpetrators of violence against the children. Only in the United States, quoting, the number of children who received a child protective service investigation increased 10 percent from 2013 to 2017. Important risk factors were the caregiver, alcohol or drug abuse. So due to several factors, among them poverty, the asymmetry between child and caregiver is not prospected and caregivers may use the child the weakest part as a means of violent discharge of tensions resulting in emotional physical and or sexual abuse the consequences are well known and documented dissociation hindering the capacity for symbolic activity for thinking as well as the congealing of development the schizoparanoid position. The adult who was victim of abuse when a child will have a greater chance to be engaged in abusive behaviors, as Mali has pointed out very clearly, making such condition a dramatic endless cycle, be it horizontally, that means among peers, or vertically, transgenerational propagation of abuse. Such transmission may also be direct when the abused adult abuses his or her child or via projective identification when the traumatic experience is transmitted unconsciously to the offspring. I'll bring three brief examples of this last points. Uh, the first of them from a supervisor. First example. G is a five-year boy who came to analysis because of aggressive behavior at school. G's mother has been sexually abused when she was a child. During his sessions, G is extremely aggressive towards both the analyst and a baby doll, and also has sometimes a highly sexualized licking behavior. He licked uh, himself on the mirror, for example. One day, while playing of being a demon who ate uh, children, he said, a bad man hit me. Then I became paranoid. And he kind of dramatized the paranoid. This is in his own words. The pervert got through the window and now he's here with us. Look how mad I am. This sequence has been understood as the revival of mother's suppressed memory of abuse and her unconscious transmission of such register to her son, making him the violent boy who would compensate mother for her experience of hopelessness and passivity. Second example, M is the father of a teenager the teenager I assessed it because of rebel and aggressive behavior. But I'll talk about the father. And the father told me that his son was very violent towards his mother and grandmother as a toddler. Later in the uh, consultation, M, the father, talks about his own childhood living with his grandmother in an extremely violent neighborhood because his mother had left him and fled with a criminal. In order to survive, he became violent too, at the point of being nicknamed the crazy. Afterwards, he went to college and built a family, 
becoming a rather pacific man. At the very end of the assessment, M confesses he is a spiritualist and he keeps this faith and this practice because he have been, he, both he and his son, have been healed by spiritualism. And then he tells that one night when this, his son was a baby um, or a toddler, he saw a bad spirit lying at the side of him and intending to steal his son. He prayed aloud and could retrieve the child from evil. These interpretations were, in my view, an attempt to make some meaning of violence suffered during childhood. But it was clear how these unprocessed experiences demanded to be relieved to, through the next generations. The last example is from a colleague who worked with ancestral families and their daughters, bringing dramatic evidence of the difficulty these adolescents have in being believed and supported by their own mothers. She used the colleague Frank's concept of Ferloinum to describe the destruction of truth perpetrated by the whole family. At the point of denying, in one of the cases, the ancestral birth of a baby girl, fathered by the adolescent's father. They considered her, the little girl, just another daughter of the parental couple. Having their own perception of reality refused, the girls either rebelled and were thrown away by the families or resigned themselves to living a half-life. Thus, in child abuse, families may be unreliable, sticking to denial in order to avoid disruption. So whose responsibility in dealing with abuse is that? The only answer in my view is the state. Otherwise, the potential for multiplying the deleterious effects of violence will be huge. All developed countries are well aware of these facts and put a lot of effort in implementing programs directed to preventing and treating child abuse. The collaboration of civil society with the government establishes the best ground for more comprehensive and efficient measures. In Brazil, however, during 2019, last year, we witnessed the frontal attack to human rights in several areas. For example, police violence, environment, education, et cetera, et cetera. According to a journalist, wherever you look, you see pure and furious destruction. In the wake of a general dismantling of every past conquer to improve social justice, health professionals are dumbfounded by the contemptuous attitude of government concerning children's rights. Since the beginning of his term, sexual education has been banned from school. They argue this should be done inside the child's family. The ultra -conserv conservative rationale was that families own their the children and the state should not interfere. In last September, Brazil's president exonerated several counselors and limited social participation in the National Council of Children's and Adolescents' Rights, besides facilitating his direct interference in it. But in the last 30 years, this council was responsible for several measures and campaigns against violence sexual abuse and eradication of child labor. In a country where 230 children and adolescents are abused per day, this governmental tendency creates huge concern. From 2009 to 2014, more than 35,000 children 
have been sent to a hospital due to aggression, and 10% of them died. We know that the most of the aggressions to the child are perpetrated by parents or siblings. What put families at the epicenter of violence and of its transmission? Ergo, leaving the problems to be sorted out by emotionally disturbed families is, in a more optimistic perspective, the hallmark of neglect or being more radical of what has been called necropolitics. That's it. Very much, uh, you have underlined very important psychoanalytic contributions to child abuse, uh, specifically mental functioning of victims as well as perpetrators. And the mechanism underpinning dramatic and endless cycles of repetition. You also leave open for later discussion uh, fundamental questions about political powers and social responsibilities. Thank you. Well, now it's the turn of our third panelist, Dr. Jennifer Davids. Uh, I tell you very briefly about some of her related scientific activities. She's a fellow of the British Psychoanalytical Society. She lives in London, works full time practice. Jennifer is a child, adolescent, and adult psychoanalyst. She's a supervising analyst for child and adolescent psychoanalysis. Original trained at the Anna Freud Center, she then worked on the clinical and teaching staff for over 20 years. Jennifer also worked in the public sector as a consultant. Her special interests include the links between child and adult psychoanalysis, adopted and looked after children, and the interface between politics and psychoanalysis. Well, Jennifer, it's over to you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to talk about the abuse of too muchness in the current context of the digital era and particularly going to talk about digital families and what I call digital abuse. We're only beginning to realize how we as digital immigrants and our children as digital natives think and behave in our changed cyberspace era and how the cultures of the two worlds, cyber and real, mutually affect one another. The fields of cyber psychology, psychoanalysis and neurology and neuropsychology are beginning to throw light on the subject. The cyber effect, Aiken has termed this concept, that people interact differently online as compared to in the face-to-face -face real world. Well, we'll have to see if we do in the webinar. When we communicate by email and texts, we lack the cues that we normally rely on. In the anonymity of the other, we reveal more of ourselves and at a greater speed. And so we have what is called cyber disinhibition, and we have what is called instamacy, which is relying on speed and mass. Even on Skype, and webinar, <laughs> um, we, our images lack three dimensions. Although are, these are pretty good images, I have to say, but on Skype, we lack the three dimensions often. So our sensory and perceptual experiences are different when using cyberspace. The nature of the cyber world and the digital object. By accessing the web, we have joined the global village and have widened our internal and external worlds. There is an absence of physical touch, and this is a theme in my presentation, of real objects. Instead, we have a click of a button, a swipe of a screen. Touching the screen has, it seems, has it seems replaced the touch of another human being. The bodily cues are different. 
the virtual images lack the real body's three-dimensional shape, texture, and smell. The cyber world is omnipresent, instantaneous. In it and on it, our time sense is altered. There's little time for digestion, reflection, and thought. It privileges and encourages action, immediate response. So it's pleasure seeking with little space for considering and weighing up consequences. In cyberspace, time is bent. Messages fly across space, reaching others far away on the planet. Our concepts of time, availability, and space are altered. And I believe, as many others do, that hyperconnectivity is different in many ways from in vivo connection. The digital object is also all seeing and can be revealing and invasive, intruding on privacy. We literally see into one another's home spaces, bedrooms, even beds. Digital abuse, to my mind, is when cyberspace via the smartphone, tablet or laptop is misused and may even lead to signs of addiction. The digital family. Now, I think increasingly it is, this is very important and links to some of what Marley spoke about and Vera. But we seem to be having a new kind of family structure in that the digital object has become a new family member used as a dummy, a babysitter, an entertainer. And more and more, we see families where each member of the family is on their device, parents and children. So everyone's on two tracks. It's becoming increasingly rare to be the recipient of another person's sole attention. And yet full on communication is one of humankind's basic and precious needs. The digital object can become a new family member who is engaging, colorful, constantly in flux, and invites immersion. Although cyberspace can be interactive, it can induce passivity and addictive behaviors. Children, instead of actively using their imaginations by drawing or dreaming or playing together, turn to the untapped movies or games available in the cyber world. Now, there's a kind of magical control by the fingers, which can touch a button or swipe across a screen to switch on such worlds, a new kind of click, but perhaps just as magical as the click of fingers or of heels, like in The Wizard of Oz. So omnipotence. When such devices are lost or taken away, children and adults, let's not leave ourselves out, often suffer withdrawal, feeling lost, empty, footloose in a non-digital world resembling other addicts. And I think here that Mark Soames reminds us of Freud's 1950s observation, which is very pertinent, Freud writes, masturbation is one major habit, the primal addiction, and that it is only as a substitute and replacement for it that the other addictions come into existence. Cyberbullying and abuse. The mind of the bullied child who's usually already susceptible to serious self-doubt and self-deprecation is taken over by the bully and the threat of the bully. But with the internet, this infiltration is experienced as even more persecuting, shaming, and invasive. Several children and adolescents have told me the bullies are not just at school. They are everywhere. You can't leave them behind. Texts and photographs are used to persecute the victims, many of whom find it difficult to switch off their devices. Photos and drawings can be put up on the internet without permission, resulting in shame and humiliation. Often there's little or no protective shield. There may be a lack of parental control and little effective regulation that limits screen time and access. 
The heroes of many young people are being affected too. And fortunately, these celebrities are starting to share and write about their experience of cyberbullying and abuse. Football abuse is rising in the UK, and I'm going to quote from a recent article by a prominent black footballer. Imagine you're a prominent black footballer. Once the racist abuse you received would have come from the terraces, and as soon as you escape the terraces, you escape the abuse. But now the abuse comes home with you. Comments flood your social media accounts, sometimes thousands. It doesn't stop. Abusers tag your name alongside hateful single word insults or send you grotesque images or post pictures that suggest the type of violence they would like to visit upon you. It's relentless. Here we see how public, excessive and shameful the racist abuse is, multiply disseminated over the internet. I sense in victims of cyberbullying a feeling that there's no place to hide. I'm going to go on very briefly to the case of Vanessa, an adolescent who'd been looked after by her uncle and aunt because of the mental health issues of both her parents who'd been addicted to serious drugs and alcohol. Vanessa had poor self-esteem and found learning and relationships difficult. She tended to develop intense relationships with girls in which she sought the mothering she had not received, and these relationships soon broke down. We'd been working together once weekly for some time when the disgruntled Vanessa, uh, who was once again checking her smartphone, she used to bring it to sessions, and who was technology savvy, much more than me, yawned and casually revealed to me that she was feeling tired because of her late nights. It emerged bit by bit over several sessions that she was texting and Skyping a new friend on her phone from her bed. She had met Robbie over the internet. It, they, it wasn't a dating app. It was that they had a shared a mutual interest, actually a creative interest. So it wasn't a uh, dating situation. I realized that Robbie was living on the other side of the world with a considerable time difference. Their intimacy had formed quickly and shared the intensity of Vanessa's other friendships. Yet there was something extra special about this relationship. I was reminded of pen pals. The excitement of corresponding with someone far away, different from oneself and one's own culture. However, there were important differences. The longer nature of letters, the time to write, read, reread, and send and wait for a response are all longer. And there is the physicality of the object, the envelope, the stamp, the paper. Of course, a letter has, li has been literally touched by the sender and the receiver can hold and touch the sheets of paper. Another difference is that distance and time were acknowledged, space too. Whereas with Vanessa, such coordinates seemed to dissolve. Robbie was there at a ping and she could, and often did, ping a response back instantaneously. And of course, there was the compulsive checking on her phone, not the looking in the physical letterbox. For Vanessa, her faraway friend was every bit as real and important as her nearby peers. Interestingly, Robbie lived in the same country where Vanessa's former idealized therapist, with whom she'd formed a symbiotic relationship, had unexpectedly gone to live. From day one, Vanessa had made it clear that I could never match up to her first therapist whom she worshipped. Similarly, I realized that Vanessa and Robbie had formed a kind of twinship bound by the secrecy of their connection. I recall sometimes feeling excluded from this intense 24-7 relationship. I could not compete with the availability and excitement of Robbie. I realized there was an addictive quality to what I called for myself, their cyber cocoon. 
it seemed that Vanessa obliterated the reality of distance and different time zone. Separateness, separation, and abandonment were denied, too awful for fragile Vanessa to experience. Their special connection was not to be thought about or challenged at any cost. Of course, adolescents can develop addictive relationships in the real world, but in cyberspace, there is cyber disinhibition and the cyber effect where intimacy gathers a pace without the ostensive cues we normally rely on. The instant availability of the object online, like a drug, cannot compete with an analyst's limited availability. So to conclude, our digital devices can become parts of ourselves, even extensions of our bodies. Sometimes when people lose their phones, they say that if they, they've lost part of their bodies, lost parts of themselves. Hyperconnectivity seems to have replaced ordinary family communication and relationships. In these digital families, what are the implications for how children relate to others? What does it mean for children's future development? including their language development and their brain development. Recently, I saw at a restaurant a two and a half little girl and her dad, and the meal hadn't arrived. Um, and so the dad tried to play with her, she wasn't interested. So he gave her the mobile phone with something on it. Um, and she was looking at it, very interested. And then this lovely, playful dad tried to play with her by pulling faces and putting on voices. You couldn't have wished for more. And you saw the little girl, it was as if she needed four eyes, not two, because she wanted to look at the mobile phone and she wanted to look at her dad. So what are we actually doing to our children when we use these devices? And then finally, I want to just pose a question for the audience um, is with this cultural shift and information revolution, which of course got wonderful sides to it, are we living in an age of big brother, of surveillance, which we don't always know how to shut down? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for your detailed description of this very specific form of child abuse arising from the effects of overstimulation in the cyber culture. Well, now uh, it's time for the second part of our uh, webinar. We are going to open the dialogue with the attendees uh, remember, please, that you can, can post your questions, typing it at the box on the right side of your screen called questions. We received several questions. Uh, I begin from this one. Um, do the panelists think that there has been an increase in child abuse and other forms of violence against children in recent times? Or is it just a question of greater awareness and better reporting of these situations? It's addressed to the whole panel. Who wants to begin? Well, I, I could say uh, something to that. Um, okay, Mali. Uh, I think, uh, like I said, uh, only very recently, in 1960s, we started really paying close attention and um, uh, figuring out what, uh, how we can do to detect the child abuse, like in professional offices, say, clinical social worker, pediatricians, child psychiatry, child psychologists, all of us. But it, it really has not been formally um, defined until 1962. And at least in US, uh, United States, that's been the history. 
so uh, yes, once that brought to our attention, I think we are more aware um, in terms of figuring out uh, the, uh, this this passion for abuse. So I think um, it's a way of thinking that we ought to keep that in mind when we see someone in our office to look for the possibility, not behaving like a detective, but more figuring out and giving out, giving an opportunity to um, to listen carefully. And through our listening, we might be able to figure out what might be going on. And a lot of times that's not possible until much later, just like the case I was bringing up. It took nine months before I found out that was going Thank on. Thank you, Mandy. Vera, Jennifer, do okay. you want to add? Uh, yes, uh, Vera. I'll try to send a few words. Uh, the question is similar to the problem of autistic disorders, for instance, because uh, there is a, 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 a a great uh, greater prevalence of autistic disorders uh, from the 90s on and is it because there are more uh, autistic disorders or uh, because people are more uh, aware well uh, it has been tackled by several uh, publications and scholars and uh, nothing has been uh, clear and has been explained, uh, but it seems there was uh, an in increase in the prevalence in aut autistic disorders. Well, going back to the point of child abuse, there, there is more awareness, but maybe we still are uh, dealing with uh, new things happening a new style of child rearing and how Jenny said uh, people are more isolated and poverty is has bigger impact I, I don't know if it has bigger but we can't forget about poverty because this has a direct link uh, with child abuse too so I don't think we can answer this question clearly and objectively but we have to research on this point to uh, to see what we should do to decrease the rates thank you Vera. Yeah. well we pass to the second question um, One thing is what psychoanalysis can offer in the intimacy of the consulting room. Another is what we can offer to the teams we work in and to the culture in which we inhabit. Given the shortage of staff in the UK, which affects the capacity to think with increased caseloads and the easy with which action is taken. How can we become effective in bringing about an understanding of the importance of this issue in child and adult services? Yes, Jennifer. Uh, shall I start? Yes. No, if I you want. No, no. Somebody else? Like. No, no. <laughs> Now, go I, ahead. Think, I think it's very important that the clinicians on the front lines, particularly in the UK, um, child psychotherapists, child analysts working in the public sector or the national health service, as we call it, are under terrible uh, pressure, as the questioner has indicated from what I could hear. And I think one of the importance, uh, vital importance is not to be working on one's own the importance of having a team or a supervision group where things like this can be discussed. Because otherwise there's a terrible risk of the professionals, as you said, not being able to think, but worse than that, a burning out 
and also precipitative action being taken, which isn't always very helpful. So it, it really is a huge issue. Um, there are no shortcuts, in my view, to um, identifying and treating abusing families and abused children and adolescents. It's a very complex and deep problem, which where the treatment is not going to be overnight, as we all know. It often is quite uh, long. Thank you, Jennifer. Someone else want to continue or we pass to the next question? Related to the others. Um, One thing is what psychoanalysis can offer in the intimacy of the consulting room. I know, sorry, I, I read that. Uh, second, please, it's, it's overlapping. While you're looking for um, a third um, items or third questions, I can also add something to what uh, Jenny has ah. to say. Oh, please do it. About that. Yes. 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 Um, I, I think the idea about the teamwork is very important. I know we as a psychoanalyst, we work mm -hmm. in the privacy of a consultation room, mm -hmm. and we don't have much contact with outside work compared to some other professions. Okay. So the legal profession, professions is good to have a liaison contact. It's a more like an interdisciplinary approach. So um, it, it's very isolating. And if we just want to rely on our own observations only and hear the story, but it's important to also bring the social um, worker, social service into the picture. And um, so that way it will prevent us from getting burned out and also having uh, uh, colleagues that we can consult with. That's the most crucial thing that we have to do. We have to keep that in mind. Otherwise, um, it will get lost. In other words, we may not be able to use the judgment that uh, would be helpful for a child's uh, uh, you know, uh, treatment. Uh, at that point that we see the cases is more like a treatment a kind of a strategy, how we can come up with, um, how we can detect and then uh, be able to offer a strategy how to handle it. And I don't think it only takes one person to handle it. So school people also sometimes are involved. So the community, let's say church and other kind of um, support system, uh, we can uh, connect with. And I understand the importance of the privacy and um, um, and confidentiality and all of that. But to great extent, we can really uh, get out of our consultation office more metaphorically to be able to um, connect with other professionals and figure out how to handle these serious cases. Do you want to add I, any Yes, I, I completely agree with Vali. And I think even uh, in psychoanalytic institutions, we should have a team to discuss this case because if uh, otherwise you won't be able to tackle this by yourself. It's a very it's impossible to deal with this huge problem as a isolated uh, practitioner. Thank you. Yes. Very important. Yes, Jennifer. I just wanted to add, of course, the, the aspect, as we all know, of the counter-transference with abuse, whether it's yes. in the consulting room. Um, we know that it's one of the most difficult counter-transferences to bear because it's so horrifying and stupefying that we ourselves can often feel shocked, especially when the child begins to reveal some of the details of the abuse. And then culturally, I think it's also outside the consulting room. I think it's also hard to take on board what we as human beings can do to one another. I, th I think it takes a lot of work 
to really see what some people have called evil. Um, if you yeah. think of Valerie Sinison's work or people before that, mm -hmm. probably many other people who've written about it, but really, really difficult things to accept and to think about. I agree. But there's one thing I want to add also. Um, our work as the child analyst and adolescent analyst, this kind of situation cases comes and is so fresh, right? And in present time, we have to deal with that. It's a bit different than the <clears throat> dealing with the adults that they bring up memories of their past abuse. And I wanted to have a chance to compare and contrast, but you may not have time to get into that. But currently I have an adult <clears throat> patient who is in analysis with me in her early 30s. And recently there was some memory that was uncovered the memory of her mother, whenever she misbehaved, mother would fill out the bathtub with ice cubes and would force her into the bathtub. And, you know, apropos to what Jennifer, Jenny is saying, that hearing that was shocking for me. That was the method that the mother used, punishing the girl over a small infraction. And so she would decide at what point the girl had to step out of the bathtub that was filled with the ice cube. And as she was telling me, it was just devastating for me to hear that. And then she added that her little sister also was getting punished that way. And she was helpless. She couldn't help the younger sister either. So this is a mother who did that. So it, it's um, a, a bit different, but you know, nevertheless, the countertransference reaction is very strong. Um, even though it was in a past memory, it felt like here in present. Um, there's a bit of immediacy when the child is being abused and you see it right with your own eyes, just like the case I, I said that the black and blue signs right on his body. Uh, with us to Another connected question. What do the panelists think about managing the conflict between the obligation to legally report a situation of abuse and the principle of confidentiality of the psychoanalytical setting? Yeah. Well, um, I, I can go first <laughs> because I had to, I, I encountered that several times, and I gave you a, a, a short case in the other about the ten-year-old Tyler. Um, I was debating to report or not to report, and this I've done that in the past when I was a child psychiatrist in my past life <laughs> a long time ago. But, you know, there was a bit different kind of situations uh, that the reporting was very uh, important to do that. But here, I'm not trying to say that because we have children in analysis, therefore we should refrain from reporting. But it really has to do with the, my relationship with this specific case, a 10-year-old with the mother, that I was doing parent work. So that created a bigger dilemma, whether or not it was immediate for me to to uh, call anyone, the Child Protective Service or not, at least in this particular case. And especially when the young boy, Tyler, told me, I could have called the police on her. You are not going to call, are you, Dr. Mann? And I said, that's a very important question we need to talk about and think about together. But I, you know that I have to see, you will be seeing your mom about that too. So I can only report that what happened to this case, because over time, the mother, with the work that we've been doing, I have not heard any further um, kind of concern um, or anything related to the physical abuse, the way um, this little boy suffered first son that he reported to me. Uh, so he he said it stopped and it's, my mom is not doing it. And so 
uh, the mother was doing some analytical work with another analyst and I did my parents' work. So it's a kind of a, uh, several people are involved in that. Um, the school uh, psychologist was uh, involved. Um, so the answer to that question is really, is case by case, I would think. Mm -hmm. um, we are obligated legally to report, no doubt. Um, but again, we have to really assess the situation, see whether it warrants a legalistic approach or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. And maybe other panelists could also, um, you know, share your ideas about reporting or not reporting. This is it's uh, an important I, one. I agree with you, Mali, uh, that it's case uh, by case, because otherwise, will uh, function like uh, a protocol uh, doer. Uh, that is, we'll have a protocol. So we are obliged to uh, to tell the authorities, but we know that in some cases, the results are worse. Uh, if a particular child goes to foster home, uh, they, can, uh, they may be unlucky and repeat in a, in, in a, a worse form the abuse. Well, uh, if you see there is a risk in not reporting, but if you see there, there is any kind of possibility of thinking with the family, I, I guess it's important to have this time, to give this time to family with them, working with them. Uh, but sometimes you see that there is no way, there is a pathology, a very ingrained pathology, and you have to protect the child. Uh, so I think it's similar to the superego. If you are a protective superego or if you are a legal superego, only this and nothing else. Mm -hmm. I agree with what Miley and Vera have said very eloquently. But I just want to share that sometimes in the UK, if you do decide in this particular case that you need to report because you're not getting anything from the school or from whoever, the doctor, whoever it might be, sometimes when one reports to the social services in this country, they don't think that's abuse. So, for example, emotional abuse, they, which is often very difficult to give evidence for or uh, the level of neglect they can often say but that's not what we really are concerned about we've got much more serious cases than this and it's almost like what are you calling us for mm -hmm. and this is i think also very important about the subtlety of abuse that it's not only about the marks and the poverty the point vera made about poverty and the link to abuse mm -hmm. is vital but it can often be very subtle for example, in, dis in different socioeconomic groups, in the upper middle classes, uh, in England we still have our class system, um, you know, you can find very subtle emotional abuse, which is just as horrifying and just as deleterious as more mm -hmm. severe kinds of abuse. Yeah. Well, I agree with Jenny and Jenny <clears throat> about that because physically, <clears throat> let's say the battered child syndrome, so we can go and get x-ray or see the lab test and all the other things, sexual abuse, physical abuse, but the emotional scar are not visible. So that's hard to prove that, mm -hmm. you know, how are you going to protect the child? How, what are the strategy we come up with? You know, there, there are differences among professionals that we mm -hmm. all you know, have to help other people to understand this is as bad as physical abuse. Um, just because it's not being seen, it doesn't mean it doesn't have its impact. Yeah. I agree that this is a difficult dilemma because uh, school people, they say, we don't see anything, you know, um, it makes it difficult. Yeah. Very difficult question. I know this. 
we pass to another question in some way connected. Um, it refers to intergenerational trauma and ask how it is dealt with. <clears throat> are, you, are you talking about the uh, psychotherapy, um, the kind of uh, intervention one could make in terms of psychoanalytic, psychodynamic approach or psychoanalytic approach, how one could tackle it's that? Global, a global question, no specification, so each of you might answer from different aspects. Okay. Jenny, you want to go first? Not now, I'm just thinking. <laughs> I was thinking Maybe if better. we, yes, just an initial uh, thing. I was thinking if uh, it's a different kind of work. Uh, I think it's the same kind of work you do in psychoanalysis with all uh, repressed memories or uh the the non symbolized uh part of the mind uh, i think it's you can't have a formula for this kind of uh strategy or a, a, a technical thing because it will depend on how you build a dialogue with this particular patient and how you pay attention to the voids or to the parts which are non symbolized, and you will have to make connections. So it's difficult to answer in a general form this question because it will depend and you will work. You know that there is such kind of transgenerational trauma, and you, you'll have to sort out how, for this patient, it makes sense to put things together and build with him a meaning of what he experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do agree with uh, what you're saying, the complexity of this situation. Uh, however, I think it's a more like a multi-system approach, one could say it, mm -hmm. family system, individual psychotherapy, and you know, we have to work with, uh, you know, parents particularly, there are, uh, some centers that they're focused on the trauma focused kind of a cognitive behavior approach working directly with the parents how to help them with the new skills of parenting so that would not happen or stop it the, and then the child of course we have the child in psychoanalysis or psychoanalytic therapy then uh, we have to learn how to uh, help the child by encouraging it um, to tell us more through their play therapy and through what goes on, it, it comes up anyway. Um, so more encouraging that. Um, so it's a kind of a multi-systemic approach, I would think. And, you know, we still can be a psychoanalyst in our office and play therapy doing that and watching and seeing what goes on and using our own techniques. But I think it takes more than just that. But and Mali, are, Mali like are you talking about family therapy or individual psychoanalysis? I'm talking about both because this is a multi-system. That means it could it would uh, take sometimes family therapy because family members are going to be affected because, it's true. because we have one child in treatment. It doesn't mean other ch children are not going to be affected. So it's just systemic approach, meaning family system. So we may have to come up with ideas about involving the parents in family therapy. I know it may sound very much um, um, contrary to what the older analytic community are used to, that we would just see one person at a time. In my way of working, I work with parents a lot. So working with parents is very crucial. And that, you know, and that sometimes I bring siblings too. So in a way, we have to include other people to get um, to get them to see what's happening and not just isolating one child. At some level, we need to improve 
and expand our um, our team approach. I mean, I'm sure you can we can argue about that uh, how and when we can when we can do that. But I think there are cases that requires that kind of a support that comes from um, it's a multifaceted kind of sources of support that comes up and helps. Like, you know, how can we not work with the school, for instance? You know, the, the school calls and says, Johnny is misbehaving, what do you think? We are about to expel the child and the child is hitting and biting the other person. So you are the therapist, what do you suggest? So they need our help too. So I oftentimes spend time working with the school people trying to uh, make them understand what goes on, you know, because the behavioral approach in the classroom could be part of an added approach to what we do in our own office also. Because, they, you know, the child will understand that the classroom has to be <clears throat> controlled by the teacher and the teacher is the boss and you cannot cause disturbances in the classroom. And the parents of other kids are going to cause you know, come with complaints and school people are going to get involved and so forth. So <clears throat> this is just one example and talking about how um, we need to learn and keep in mind that the school could be another added uh, uh, source of support. And um, hopefully they will, you know, go along with us because we try to uh, inform and educate them that what goes on in the privacy of our therapeutic uh, you know, environment, or with the work that we do with the kids, that it could extend itself outside to the to the school, to the classroom situation. I think there's a um, sort of an, another aspect because, as I said in my presentation, that abuse can have a kind of addictive quality and a kind of cocoon-like quality or psychic retreat if you take Steiner's ideas. And the idea of a third coming in and actually offering another perspective can be very challenging and threatening, but it can also be quite life-saving. So in the idea of transgenerational, this, this despair that some parents have, they've been abused, so is it going to trickle down and inevitably be repeated? There can be an enormous hope when a third comes in and says, well, maybe not. You don't have to keep on repeating this. There is another way. So I think there we can see the interface between psychoanalysis and more socio-cultural kind of thought, which also might be opposing, just that we have to keep on repeating in this compulsive way these horrible things, that there are actually other ways of thinking rather than this dyadic or psychotic-like way of not being able to think differently. So maybe the first line of work for this kind of transgenerational trauma uh, should be family therapy, or uh, because you will need someone to tell them. You don't have to repeat it, because it's a different context if you have a patient in individual psychoanalysis. That's very true. You know, I mentioned that how the social psychological model is important to think about it in that way. And the family structure model is another one. And, you know, we, we got to kind of incorporate that together in order to be helpful. There has been research also that showed, I, I can't remember right now, Pan, I have it in my paper somewhere, that it does show that a third of this kind of family, abusive family, when they are involved in a um, treatment um, multi-model approach, they stop these transmissions of the uh, generational transmissions of the trauma. It doesn't stop. There has been follow-up um, to those research that it shows that it doesn't have to get trickled down to the next and next generation. So it's one third, those, one third of the people who really have been actively involved in treatment, it has to stop that cycle. But the ones who haven't gotten any help or little help, marginal help, they continue that 
it, it, it has been observed that's been continued. And um, <clears throat> offhand, I can't remember the name of that research group that they did that, but that's very hopeful. Last question oh. on the same line. We are very brief on time. Please, do you have is a, a, a task of help? Please, do you have any recommendations for child analysts toward this strategy of work with abusing parents who are in the state of denial, defensiveness? And, and having strong negative transference toward the analyst of his child, what would sh should be the first steps or main topics feeling to discuss and process? Uh, Ines, could you repeat that? I'm not sure I understood totally. Uh, did you receive it on, on? Can you read it in the screen or not? No, no, it can't no. see that. Well, I repeat. No. Please, okay. do you have any recommendation for child analysts towards the strategy of work with abusing parents who are in the state of denial, defensiveness, and having strong negative transference towards the analyst of his child? What should be the first steps or main topics to discuss and process? Well, um, I, to... I, oh, sorry, okay. Melly. No, go ahead. Go, go ahead. Because uh, I remember what Jennifer said about the third. Uh, a third is necessary. So only the analyst and the child are a couple, and uh, there is a need of a third uh, element for bringing light and bringing uh, more positive transference situation uh, to this family. So uh, I will think about this point, bringing someone else, other professional, other analysts, for the family. I was thinking about the little boy who I mentioned in my handouts, which some of you will be able to access, Dan. The six-year-old boy who had a Facebook account and he was completely obsessed with the internet and to the extent that the school noticed that he wasn't uh, behaving normally with other kids, his language development was poor, he didn't know how to play with them, etc. He was really becoming quite odd. And those parents, if you had to get them in, first of all, I don't think they'd think there's anything wrong until the third, the school had said, you know, this isn't normal. But I think one would have to brace oneself for, uh, you know, really parents feeling that you were criticizing their parenting, because I think they really probably believed that this is what the little boy needed. In other words, that's what they did. So they believe that's what he should be, a little adult. So I think well, perhaps as child analysts, we have to uh, sometimes, as Molly was saying, working with parents, and I am trained in the Anna Freudian tradition, and Anna Freud very much believed in working with parents. And sometimes we have to be strong mm. to take on in a humane way, but nevertheless a firm way to, to put to the parents, look at what's going on here, and it might yeah. not all be so great. Um, that's a sort of on the, the lesser pathological side of the spectrum. Of course, with very deeply disturbed parents, that's going to be even more complicated. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we are on time. Uh, I feel that it's so uh, crucial that we might have the possibility of continuing uh, discussing and reflecting together about this problem of child abuse in so many forms. Um, we are leaving many open questions, but uh, 
we have the opportunity to continue uh, this reflection online. Uh, it's uh, an open discussion to all the attendees of the webinar. Uh, you might send your uh, new questions on the webs uh, on the IPA website in a box you'll uh, find untitled uh, comments. Uh, you'll receive a written message to remember you about this possibility. And mm -hmm. so this uh, uh, task, shared task, goes on open. Uh, I now, uh, <laughs> uh, a last comment. I remember you that our next webinar will take place on February 23rd. At that time, the subject will be on pain as an intersection between psychoanalysis and the arts. We hope you'll join us again. Well, bye-bye. Thank you bye. very much to all bye of bye. you attendees you. and panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Ines. Thanks, Ines.